settle down. We'll check the temperature, see if you're all right. In here now, ain't eh? We'll try to cool you off here a little bit. This preaching might cool you down a little, I reckon. Luke chapter 24 is our text for our Easter Sunday message this morning. Luke chapter 24. I like the way the Holy Spirit wrote this scripture here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach you a message about it this morning. Luke chapter 24. Amen. Might get me down just a little higher. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Verse number 1. Now, upon the first day of the week, that's today, that's what Sunday is. Sunday is not the Sabbath. Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath. Sunday's the first day of the week. You can look on your calendar and tell any money to you. Start today. That's when he rose from the dead. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and served with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, there out, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they, these men, said unto the disciples, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how ye spake, how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Look back at verse 5. The disciples were came, came and looked in the tomb. It was empty. Two angels stood by and asked this question. Why seek ye the living among the dead? They said, you're looking for somebody who's alive, but you're looking around a bunch of dead people. Why do you seek the living among the dead. The title of my message this morning is Wrong Address. Wrong Address. You've got the wrong address. They said, you guys are looking for the wrong person here in this tomb. This man's alive. Why are you looking for him around the dead? I got to thinking about that. And I thought of all the good things about the resurrection of the Lord. They buried him in a barred grave. You ever wonder why they borrowed that tomb? Why didn't they buy it? Because he wasn't needing it but three days, and he'd give it back to them. That's why they borrowed the tomb. They, the angels looked on, and the bells of heaven rang. He burst the bonds of death and tore the bars asunder and rose from the grave and came but forth to live forevermore. Now the angel preached it, and the angel sure can preach. Uh, they they uh, were at this tomb this day, and they asked them, have you ever got a, a letter in the mail and it came to the wrong address? Got somebody else's mail. And uh, you'd say, well, he'll, oh, uh, uh, Tom, so-and-so, that ain't me. You thought you put it back in the mailbox or give it back to the mailman or throw it away or whatever you do. They sent it to the wrong address. Have you ever had your mail go to somebody else's address? And it gets everything all stuck. Wrong address. You got the wrong one. This is the wrong mailbox to be putting that in. You're looking for the wrong person here. Somebody knock on your door and it's a UPS man or the Federal Express man. Or somebody and he'll say, I have a package here for so-and-so. I'm sorry, I don't know him. You got the wrong ass, buddy. That thing goes down the road here somewhere. He's, this, that person is not here. That's kind of what the angels did that day. The disciples came and said, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And they looked in the tomb and it was empty. And the angel said, he's not here. You got the wrong address, man. You're looking for the living among the dead. And so I want to preach about that this morning. He come out of that grave. I showed you in Sunday school this morning that Jesus Christ literally rose bodily from the grave. You see, they put him in there and the Roman soldiers rolled a stone at the tomb. 
Let's just imagine that this, this where these flowers are, uh, it would be behind there, would be, would be the tomb where they laid the Lord. They said, down just a hair, brother, they said that that rock that they put in front of that tomb was that thick and the rock itself was eight feet in diameter. Eight feet. That means that rock would be from here where, where I, my, this end is over to about here where this end is and that thick and round, maybe this high. I don't know. Some here might tell us how much a rock like that weighs. It'd be several tons, I guarantee it. I'll guarantee you there's not a man in here that could move a rock that big with your, just, you know, just with your own strength. They, they might be, but I doubt it. Uh, this, this big rock was laying there, and you know what they said? They put them guys there, and they got around it. And the Roman soldiers stood around here and guarded that thing like this. Here stood one, here stood one, here stood one. And they put a seal on that. The Roman government seal on that tomb. And brother, you know what they done? They said, nobody gets in and nobody gets out. They took his body down off the cross where they had beat him. And you know, I told somebody this yesterday when he was out visiting. I told him, I said, do you know why he, they beat him? If you saw the movie, that Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of Christ, they beat him and they beat him and they beat him and they whipped him and they kept whipping him and kept whipping him and beat the blood, for the blood running down his face and down his back. And as a matter of fact, the movie doesn't even show it as bad as it really was. In the book of Isaiah, the Isaiah said that his visage, his appearance was marred more than any man. They beat him till his body looked like a piece of hamburger meat. Uh, the, Lord, they just, the blood run down uh, the toe. You couldn't even recognize him as a man. And every time they slapped him like that, they did that for what me and you done wrong. Everything you done wrong, everything I done wrong, they beat him. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And brother, you think about every low down in your life, every cuss word you ever said, every time you turned up a beer, every time you put a joint, every time you told a lie, everything you've ever done wrong in your life, he let them beat those nails to his hand to pay for that. I'm telling you this morning, I stand here this morning with all my sins paid for because of what he did on the cross. Amen. Thank God he paid the price for our sins. Hallelujah! He paid the price for your sin. Hey girls, have you ever done anything bad? Hey young men, have you ever done something really bad? Jesus got to pay for that sin. You know there's some people that will get up this morning and go to church because it's Easter and they think if I go to church Easter, God won't be mad at me. I right, listen, that ain't got nothing. Going to church on Easter Sunday don't pay for one of your sins. You can go to church seven days a week the rest of your life and it ain't going to pay for a sin. Only His blood pays for sin. So they took Him down from the cross and they put him in this tomb. And word had already got rumored around town that he was going to rise again. He told his disciples, he said, I'm not going to stay in the grave. I'm coming up out of the grave. And so the three days went by. One day, one night, two days, two nights. It couldn't have been on Friday, I can tell you that. There's no way in the world man can be crucified on Friday, stay in the grave three days and three nights and rise up Sunday morning. That's a Catholic tradition. He stayed in the tomb three days and three nights. So instead of Good Friday, it's bad Wednesday evening. And boy, I'll tell you what, Saturday night, or late Saturday night, before the, the, the clock ticked, up from the grave, he arose. And the controversy began to swirl. And they told the um, governor, the Roman soldiers, told him, they said, I'll tell you what, you guys tell somebody that you just fell asleep here, and that you fell asleep and he got out, and we don't know what happened to him, and we'll pay you if you'll go around telling that. But think about that this morning. Let's think. I mentioned it in Sunday school. I've been to the White House in Washington, D.C. Preached with a bunch of guys in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. And buddy, they was watching us like hawks. There's all kinds of people protesting up there saying, legalize hemp, you know, a bunch of old hippies that ain't never got over it yet. And they're all sitting around there in front of, front of uh, uh, the White House. And I remember we got our Bibles and began to preach. And I'll never forget, I preached in front of the White House. And I got to looking, there's a big old fence about as high as the ceiling right here in front of the White House. And that fence goes all the way around it. And there's men up here on top of the White House with guns. And you can watch, they walk back and forth like this right here. And if you take a foot, a foot over that step, a fence, they'll blow your head off. They are authorized by the United States government to stop you if you try to get to that White House. You're not going to get in there. You're not going to get in there, brother. It ain't going to happen. And did you know the Roman government was even less merciful than the United States government. They put soldiers around that tomb 
And they said, don't let nobody near it. And them guys standing there with a sword. And if you even tried anything, it'd be over for you. Now what they're trying to get you to believe is that every one of them guys went to sleep at the same time and laid down here and went to sleep and them disciples come up and carried them over here and laid them in the weed somewhere and rolled that stone away and got Jesus out. You mean to tell me that every one of them got to sleepy at the same time and every one of them that was so asleep Listen, if you touch me while I'm asleep, I'm going to wake up. I mean, I, if you touch, if you open the doorknob, I wake up. I just can't sleep. And, and if I'm guarding something with my life, I'm not going to let you carry me and throw me in the ditch and then come in there and get it. Brother, they didn't carry them Roman soldiers away. They did not go to sleep. If I went to sleep, I'd have went to sleep leaning up against it, wouldn't you? So if somebody had come up there and touched you, no, that, ain't, that didn't happen. He, he come out of there by his own power. And the angel came and rolled the stone away. And the disciples looked in. And the tomb was empty. And said, oh my, oh my, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. It's empty. You know, they say, they say, if you go over there in them, in them old places over in Egypt and places, those, 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 those old uh, tombs over there contain the mummified ruins of the Pharaohs and the Westminster Abbey of the nobles and the monarchs that lived there in Arlington, Washington, in Washington, D.C. contains the remains of presidents and soldiers and heroes. But to the garden tomb is the only tomb in the world people visit because of who ain't there. Somebody said, well, I want to see President Kennedy's grave. He's laying in there. I want to see Buddha's grave. He's laying in there. See Muhammad's grave. He's laying in there. I want to go to Westminster Abbey. They're laying in there. Here's one they go see where there ain't nobody in there. Uh, the Gun Tomb is the only place in the world where people line up for hours to see nothing. And if they seen something in there, they'd be disappointed. They look and the tomb is empty. You're not going to find one of his fingernails. You're not going to find one hair of his head. Brother, when that, when that clock rolled over the three days and three nights, his soul came out of paradise, went back in that body, his eyes opened up. His body was glorified. It wasn't bleeding no more. It wasn't hurting no more. And the angel brother was down there and Jesus walked right through that stone. He didn't need the angel to move that thing. Jesus was up for that angel eat breakfast that morning. He come through that rock, brother. Victorious over death. Hell in the grave. And He's my friend, my Savior. And you better not mess with Him because He's all powerful. And He's got the keys of death and hell. Boy, I'll tell you what, I, I, I'll get to my message in a minute, but I'm telling you what, can you imagine that day? Here was all the Old Testament saints down there in Abraham's bosom. Every time somebody died, they'd say, are you him? And they'd say, who? No, you ain't him. You know who we're talking about. Somebody else died, you him? Who? No, you ain't him. But about that time, boy, here come the Lord. And the Lord went down into Abraham's bosom, and he said, the Bible said He went and preached under the Spirit in prison. And the Bible said he went down. I don't know what all he done. But he went down there and there was a devil sitting there. He's thrown somewhere. And the Lord reached over and says, I'll have those. And just grabbed those keys out of his hand. And boy, he come up. And when he grabbed those keys, he said, I am alive forevermore. Have keys of death and hell. And I'm going to tell you something. When he comes back the next time, they'll never crucify him. They'll never put nails in his hands. It ain't going to happen next time. When he comes back the next time, brother... It's look out Howard Stern, you fool, because he's going to smash you. It's, and it's look out, brother, it's look out Michael Jackson. And it's look out Christina Aguilera. And it's look out, buddy, Dr. Drake. And it's, and it's look out P. Diddy. And it's look out because the Lord's coming back. And you ain't going to get him this time on no cross. And I just say stuff like that to see whose side you're on. And I can see some of you on our side. I can see other of you are messed up in the head. And I want to tell you what, brother. Listen. Listen, you hear me this morning. He had the wrong address. I want to say three things about it and we'll go. I want to say the announcement of His resurrection. They come early in the morning, grief-stricken, broken-hearted to the tomb. Amen. The angel said, Why you seek the living among the dead? It's a good question, ain't it? Why do you seek the living among the dead? There's a lot of people do that. They're hunting for something alive, but they're looking for something in dead things. If I was looking for something alive, I wouldn't go to a graveyard. Or I wouldn't go see the Grateful Dead. You know, when Jerry Garcia died, they got on there and somebody came on TV and said, the head dead head is dead. <laughs> 
I said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. The head dead, head was dead. And brother, so is it that follows them too. And I'm telling you, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why would you go looking for something alive in something that's dead? That's a good thought. You preach it well to preach on that sometime. Why would you look for something living in something dead? That's a good question. That I may I'm going to ask a lot of people to go to church more than that. Why would you look for something living in something dead? You know, most churches this morning are deader than four o'clock. Why would you go looking for the Lord in a dead church? Why would you go looking for the Lord in a dead church? That's a good question. Somebody said, well, I know my church is dead, but I just go there because my mama always... Why would you go looking for something alive and something dead? Why would you look for the Lord in a dead church? That's crazy. That's like going in the graveyard saying, Boy, I'm going to find the secret of life here. No, you're not. I seek ye the living among the dead, brother. I tell you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, life's too short to go to a dead church, huh? You're like that little boy come in one day and he said, uh, come into Sunday school and he was crying, and he was crying. She said, Son, what's wrong with you? He said, My dog, my little dog got run over. It's dead out there in the road. She said, That's all right, honey. Your little dog is up in heaven with God. He said, Well, what does God want with a dead dog? Amen. That's a good question. Good question. God don't want no dead dog. God ain't in, God, God ain't in a million miles. Of dead dog ain't with God, and God ain't in a million miles of a dead dog. God ain't in a million miles of dead religion, dead church, dead worship. It's not. It got it. Why would you seek to live in among the dead? You know, I know people go to church every Sunday. They call it church, and I'm not trying to be ugly, but my my goodness, people, they go to church every Sunday, and you sit there like you're in a funeral home. And you feel the same atmosphere you feel in a funeral home. Have you been to a church like that? It feels like you're in a blessed funeral home. And nobody, unless you're weird, likes to hang around a funeral home. There's something wrong with you if you like to hang around. I know people do, but I think there's something wrong with them. I, 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 know, I know people, that it don't matter who dies, they just go down there and hang around. But I think, oh, you're morbid, son. There's something wrong with you if you like to hang around a funeral home. I mean, I don't like it. And teenagers can't stand it. And that's the same atmosphere you feel in a lot of churches. I've been to churches where people just sit and stare. You don't hear nothing. You hear some babies crying here, but that's better than hearing nothing. I mean, we might... You say, well, these bus kids put booger seats. Well, that's better than cobwebs. Amen? I'm going to tell you something, brother. I don't want to go to a dead church. I want to go where the Lord is. I want to go where it's alive. Listen, if you go to heaven, there's going to be shouting and screaming and hollering and people shouting all over the place. If you go to hell, they're going to be screaming down there. Listen, you're not going to get out of it either way. You might as well just find the living among the living now. You like that old country singer come on there one time and he said, If there ain't no whiskey in heaven, I don't want to go. Now, that poor nut. Things ain't no whiskey in heaven. He don't want to... listen, retard. There ain't none in hell neither. <laughs> Duh! <laughs> did, did you... Somebody forgot to tell that fella. There ain't gonna be no whiskey in hell. That's where you're going if you don't go to heaven. Listen, sure there ain't gonna be no whiskey in heaven. There ain't gonna be none in hell. You better drink all you want now. I'm gonna tell you what. There ain't no dope in heaven. There ain't none in hell neither. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Why would you go around looking for something alive when something dead? That's what the Bible means. It was said, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. That's what the Lord meant when He said, Let the dead bury the dead. When somebody's living in sin, they are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. And the Lord said, Let dead people fool with dead people. You come and follow me and go where it's alive. Go where it's alive. When I got saved at Nebo Baptist Church, I passed it on the way down this morning. I showed Jeremy. I said, right up there is where I got saved. And I, I passed that church. I seen some fella going in there. Looked like going in to open up early. My heart jumps, brother, because it's only, I think, uh, next Sunday or a week from tomorrow will be my spiritual birthday. It was this time of year when I walked in there that night, 18 years old. My mom sitting back there this morning taught me about God when I was little. She set me on her knee. She read me the Bible. Mom used to go around the house. Her, my, her sister, my Aunt Shirley. And she said, go around the house singing, Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, I want to go to heaven. Hell is an awful, awful place. And it got in my heart when I was little. Even though I got out and sinned. And then we got in a rock and roll band. And then I went crazy and, and, uh, and sinned for years. When I was 18 years old, that night the Holy Ghost got a hold of my heart and drove me to church. I sat back there in the back that night 
I'm near the back on this side, and the Lord started working on my heart. And people got up and started singing. A group from Appalachian State University, a young people's group. And God got on the scene. And people started going forth crying and praying. And some girl turned around. She's sitting in front of me. Knew me from school. She said, Danny, why don't you go get saved? I said, no, it ain't my time. I thought when it was your time to get saved, you'd hear angels playing on harps. You'd hear voices. You know, you'd feel something physically pulling on you. And I said, no, I'm not ready. But she stood there a minute. My cousin was standing on this side. He punched me and said, let's go get saved. I said, I'm not ready. And the Lord was in my heart and beating at my heart and beating at my heart and beating at my heart. And all of a sudden, I got to thinking, Who's, I'm going to be a fool one of these days. If I die and go to hell, I'm going to wreck that little car sitting out there and die and go to hell. And I said, yes, Lord, I'll go. And one foot went out like this. I came and hit the altar that night. Brother, I was in something alive. I was not in something dead. You can't find something alive and something dead. I was in something alive. And brother, I hit the altar that night and I got born again. The Lord saved me that night. I've never been the same from that moment since. I've not been all I could have been. Lord God knows I failed Him a million ways. But I'm telling you, He put something inside of me that never has. Well, I got away. I can't get away from Him. I can't get away from Him. He's inside me today. I found the living Savior. I know He's alive. I know He's alive. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives in my heart. He talks to me. He walks with me and talks with me. Yes, buddy, when I do wrong, something in here says, you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong, you're doing wrong, you better quit it, you're wrong. And when I do right, something says, good boy, good boy, amen. And pa- That's right, buddy. You know when the Lord's in your heart. You know what the, they, we say? The empty tomb as to science explain this. The empty tomb says to history, repeat this. The empty tomb says to time, blot it out. But the empty tomb says to faith, believe. Then there's the appearances of the risen Lord. He appeared to Mary, a sinner. Mary wasn't a, a, a saint. She got born again. Mary had to get saved just like anybody else. Mary was blessed among women, what it said. Not above women. She's no better than anybody else. Except that the Lord chose her to be a physical incubator to have His physical body brought into this world. And so Mary had to be saved. He appeared to her. Then the other women. And then the 500. The disciples on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus. The stranger appeared beside them. And He said, where are you guys going? They said, well, we're all broken hearted, man. We, we, had, we thought we had the Savior. And we thought He's going to be the one that delivered us from, our, from bondage. And... Now he's crucified, and this is the third day, and the Lord started talking to them. It's from the scriptures. And they said their heart started burning. They had spiritual heart burn. They, had, they said, My heart burned while it's burning. And then they said, It's him! And he vanished out of their sight. And, buddy, they, 500 people saw him after he rose from the dead. And then, finally, and I'll close this morning, the ascension of the Redeemer. After 40 days. After 40 days. This is what I wish Mayo would have put in his movie. The disciples standing around him one day after he'd been alive 40 days, walking through walls, feeding people. And he said, look, I've got to go back now. And I'm going to send the Comforter. And he's going to come in my, my stead. Because I'm, I'm only here. But he'll be all over the world one time living in your heart. And if I go to the Father, I'll send him. One preacher said, we know he got back all right because the Holy Ghost came. And boy, I'll tell you what, he's standing there like that. And he looked at and he said, All power is given in heaven and earth to me. Go ye therefore and preach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And uh, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And all of a sudden he went, and shot up through the sky. What about that? And he's standing there looking like this. And an angel said, what are you doing standing here looking, boy? said, this same Jesus, the same Jesus that you saw up go up shall return in lightning. He's coming back, brother, just like He left. And the next time there'll be no nails put in His hands. The next time there won't be the crown of thorns into His head. The next time they won't laugh and mock Him and, and spit in His face. The next time it's going to shoe am going to be on the other foot. And brother, when he turns this thing around, he'll set up his kingdom and rule for a thousand years. You know, 
Your eternal destiny, as I told you in Sunday school this morning, depends on what you believe about what I just got through preaching. It's got nothing to do with your place in society, or how rich you are, or what side of town you live on, or what color your skin is, or how much money's in your pocket. Your eternal destiny depends on what I just got through telling you, whether you accept that or whether you reject it. Wrong address. Why seek you the living among the dead? Why would you go out there in the world full of dead people and try to find life? They say Budweiser gives life. It don't give life. It takes it. It takes it. Coca-Cola? No, it don't. Jesus gives life. Let me ask you something this morning. Let me ask you something this morning. Right now, where do you stand with the risen Lord? Why seek living among the dead? Let's stand by our heads for prayer.